Howdy guys, name here is Tony Motoroy from XJTalk.com. This is XJTalk.com show. Every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Central. So we've got a few more in the chat room this week than we did last. It's amazing what happens when you uh, can start the show on time. Let's see, what would we got? We've got uh, eight people and two guests. And a broadcaster. Oh, that'd be me. Hello to uh, Weldmond, uh, Argonard, Punisher72, Dalton4x4. Who else do we have there? Lizard Runner, uh, XJ4IV. I bet you Scott's fallen asleep. Because I haven't seen him chatting. As I mentioned, we have... Um, as I mentioned to the folks in the chat room before the show, we have uh, Steve Howard, um, 4.3 LXJ from xjtalk.com. He'll be live on the phone tonight. In fact, he's on the phone right now. And uh, he'll be live. We'll be discussing uh, drive angles for your Jeep Cherokee. We'll get started here in just a minute. This segment is brought to you by Iron Man 4x4, the toughest, most adjustable control arms in the industry. Iron Man 4x4 has a wide variety of rugged off-road suspension products that are overbuilt and underpriced. Visit IronMan4x4Fab.com today. That's IronMan4x4Fab.com. XJTalk.com. XJTalk.com. It's where you go when you're not off-road. Yeah, and actually... um. Andy at um, Ironman4x4fab.com is hooking me up with some adjustable lower control arms. We're doing a little trading on uh, advertisement on XJ Talk, and he's hooking me up with uh, some matching lower control arms, uh, just like the upper control arms that I got from him not too long ago. So I will be fully Ironman connected to my um, unibody and to my front axle. I'm, uh, I'm pretty happy about that. I've been wanting to get the front end, uh, the front end aligned, and I really didn't want to do it if I didn't have a way to adjust the uh, the lower control arms because uh, I've got the Rough Country original Rough Country lift uh, control arms on there. Okay, let's uh, let's get Steve on the phone. Somebody's calling. Somebody answer the damn phone. It's an XJ Talk live phone call. Hello, Steve. Are you there? I'm there. Excellent. Well, yet though on the on my screen do you have anything that you're doing you know like yeah you, just... you may have to refresh it there's a uh, the banner is up yeah I've got the banner up but I haven't had anything else with the commercial no no there's there's no video for the commercials it's all this is kind of a, a pseudo radio station type thing so okay. don't don't really do the any kind of a, a video that go along with the commercial that would be nice but uh the primary focus of the show, in case any of you guys are wondering or anybody listening on the uh, the podcast, the primary focus of the show is is audio. Uh, we throw the video up since we do the live show, so don't expect much from the video. Okay. All right, I'm not expecting much. <laughs> Can you guys hear Steve? Okay. 
That would be me asking you in the chat room. Okay, good. Yep, everything. Wow, Argonar can actually hear for a change. I, it seems like your your audio is always lower on your on your computer uh, there, Rainy. Glad to hear it sounding good. That's okay, dolls, and we can't hear your grandson practicing his voice. Headphones, that's a, that's a really good idea. When I'm listening to, Argonard says uh, he's using headphones. But when I'm listening to a, a show, especially live shows, I, I find that it's best to, to use headphones because the audio levels can change so much. You know, all this, this is much how, much like how the, um, the broadcast started in the 50s, you know. You, you could never be sure what was going to happen. Okay, Steve, um, I'll let the, uh, I've been promoting here over the last hour or so that you're going to be talking about uh, driveline uh, angles. Uh, you may have a better way of putting it, or maybe I misread the pictures altogether. So what, exa no, that's what exactly is it that you're going to discuss? Well, that's basically what it amounts to. It's how to set up a driveline once you lift uh, an XJ. And uh, we get that question so many times because people will will buy a lift kit and uh, uh, then the, as soon as they get it in and then they take it for a spin at uh, 45 miles an hour, they, they've got all this shaking going on and uh, they want to know how to fix it. And so what I wanted to do tonight is to go over the procedure on how to set the drive line up after your lift kit's done. And uh, that way you won't have to worry about the, the drive shaft vibrations and, and uh, think, oh, what did I do now? And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is actually a fairly simple procedure, but it's, it's probably one of the most confusing things to do. Well, it seems to be for a lot of folks. It's, it's not confusing to me, but I've done it a lot. Well, experience is always the best teacher. Yeah. Um, I started out doing this a uh, long time ago when I was uh, a firefighter. I used my uh, considerable time off to uh, uh, seek employment at a, a local four-wheel drive shop. And... Uh, we did engine conversions and axle conversions and suspension conversions. And, and uh, so we were always setting drive lines up. And then later on, I uh, started up my own business uh, doing uh, custom lift kits. And that was back in the uh, middle 70s. And uh, I did that for about four or five years until Rancho put me out of business because I couldn't compete with them. I think I had a Rancho. I think I had that on my uh, 83 um, Chevy pickup. That sounds familiar. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. A lot of people have Rancho stuff. They were. It was pretty cheap. It seems like I got a, a four-inch lift for a, like 180 bucks or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, I couldn't compete with that. My four-inch lifts, I think at the time I was selling for about 300 bucks, and then I would install them. That was extra. Yeah, I actually had mine installed. Uh, I was like, uh, gosh, 20, 22, 23 years old. So I was I was cruising, man. Of course, at that time, I didn't realize that uh, that lift kits were new to me. It was uh, what a lot of people around the um, around around Baytown, Texas, uh, were doing. Of course, a lot of people had six inch lifts, and I didn't want to go as high. I didn't like all that distance between the uh, the top of the tire and the uh, fender of the truck. Yeah, uh, well, a four inch was all you really needed for most of the tires until they uh, started getting taller tires, and then that necessitated more lifts. But yeah, four inch on those Chevys was just fine. Yep, I had uh, thirty six and a half inch tires. Loved those tires. They were a little skinny, um, but uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I just went to the tire shop and and told them um, that I wanted the big tire. I wanted the tire big enough to fit under the truck with the lift on it. So. Now, I think I wound up having to cut some of the fender there in the parking lot. They they supplied the hacksaw. <laughs> That's why you needed a six inch lift. Yeah, I guess so. But I I, I got a lot of compliments on it because it uh, it looked different, I, and that was the nice thing. It looked different than than everybody else. So I didn't have a six inch lift. I had a four inch lift, and it got me everywhere I wanted to go. Well, the people that I talked to uh, that had six inch lifts in those days. We're really complaining about the gas mileage on those Chevys. You know, it was like eight miles to a gallon or something like that. Yeah, I wasn't getting very good gas mileage, but, you know, back then, it wasn't that big a deal. It had dual tanks on it as well.
Yes, we are. We are old farts. And and this old fart has a really nice Jeep. <laughs> They're just jealous. <laughs> it's not the uh, it's not the age, uh, Big Jim. It's the mileage, and you're putting a lot of mileage on right now. <laughs> he's old, what he's doing? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, the that '83 Chevy that I had, it looked really nice. It was midnight blue. And I had a, um, I never could pronounce the word toner, tonier, uh, cover uh, with Velcro uh, to hold it on. I didn't like the snaps. And um, the the cool thing was uh, having, uh, I had a push bar on the front of it. You know, of course, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And um, it was, uh, I got a lot of looks, a lot of compliments. It was, it was very high, but it wasn't, you know, two inches higher. So I could still get in and out of it. I still had to grab hold of the steering wheel to get in. And uh, it was, I had mutter tires on it, so it was a blast. A lot of compliments. It was it was very much like having the Jeep. Whenever I lifted the Jeep, I got so many compliments. It was very reminiscent of uh, what I had done so many years earlier. But uh, but the, the transmission was crap. That went out on me under warranty. And the engine developed a knocking sound. Uh, they had it for 30 days at the dealership trying to fix that knocking sound. And I think all it was, it, all it wound up being was the, um, the rod that the, that the oil pump, uh, gets pushed by, uh, from the, um, I think it's the crankshaft. Maybe it's the, I can't remember if it's the camshaft or, or a crank. Anyway, the little rod that pushed the, uh, that would push the oil pump, it was, there was a gap and it was slapping it, but they fixed it. But it only, I don't know why the hell, I, Number one, I don't know why they had it for 30 days. And number two, I don't know why I let them keep it for 30 days. But they literally had it a month. Yeah, that uh, that 305 was w- way underpowered for that truck. Yeah, uh, that wasn't one of their better motors. No. I mean, the 350 would have been better, but uh, uh, a nice, like, 400. I don't, And I don't know what was available in 83. A nice 400, something, uh, either a more cube, uh, uh Small block, or better yet, a big block would have been much better for that truck, especially with the thirty-six and a half inch tires on it. Yeah, big blocks are always better in trucks. Yep, I uh, love that torque. Um, so, uh, Steve, we can we can get going anytime you're ready to. I'm fine. Let's go. So, what's the first thing we need to talk about when it comes to drive line angles? Drive line angles. I'll get it right. Well, the first thing you need to do is to figure out. Uh, what kind of driveline setup you're going to have, whether you're going to use a conventional driveline like the stock driveline or whether you're going to use a slip yoke eliminator because the procedures are different for uh, setting those two up. Okay. So uh, if you want to get the first picture up that I had there, um, we'll start with the conventional driveline. And you can... Set these up on any XJ uh, up to a four and a half inch lift, and this is a uh, an image right off of Tom Wood's website. And the the point here is is that you you're looking at the engine and it looks level, and if you draw a line through the pinion shaft, it looks level also. And what you have to do is to match those two angles. And when you lift a Jeep. Uh, many times those two angles are not matched anymore. They're matched at the factory fairly close. They're within a couple of degrees. Um, If you're anywhere within five degrees difference on those, you probably won't have any vibrations. Once you hit about five degrees, they start vibrating. At six, you start feeling it. And if you get to seven, it's going to shake you out of the rig. So... uh, The object of this whole exercise is just to match those angles. And the only way that you really know how to do it is to get a uh, angle finder and take the measurements. There's really no other way to do it except just throw parts at it and and keep buying them until you get the right combination and it stops on you. So in this situation, uh, I'm sorry, in this situation, you wouldn't want to shim anything to to try to fix it because... That would put the angle greater as you as you raise the or change the angle of the axle. 
correct? Well, actually, uh, you you probably might want to shim it. Uh, I it guess you could shim it in the back, so it, w- it would rotate the the axle forward. Well, I'll show you how to figure it out. Okay. You really usually what happens is is you end up tipping the pinion shaft down in this situation. Right. What happens is if you get a lift kit with, uh, say, an extended shackle, if you, for every inch that shackle is extended, according to my high school geometry, it changes the pinion angle by about one degree. So if you put on a uh, four inch uh, <clears throat> extension on your shackle, four inch extended shackle, and you already have a two degree difference in the angle uh, to start with from the factory, then what's going to happen is, is that puts you, uh, if you add them up, if they're in the same direction, about six degrees out, and it will probably vibrate. And, and adding a, an extended shackle is one of the most common causes of uh, a vibration in a rear drive line on a Cherokee, I think there is. So uh, uh, the point is, now also, each lift kit manufacturer designs their own springs. And some of them are, are curved a little differently than others, and some of them come with shims already on the springs. Uh, there's no rule of thumb for that. And so what you have to do is once you get it installed and get the weight on the vehicle and it's sitting there, you just have to get an angle finder out and start taking some measurements so you'll know whether or not you need to make any other corrections. So let's go to the next uh, picture, if you would. Okay, let me ask you a quick question about this one. Now this this is an example of a stock uh, XJ. This would be with the SYE. I'm sorry, not with the SYE, the, the stock with the, the slip yoke. Yeah, stock drive line one you join at each end. Okay. And... Um, Okay, well, I'll, I'll save that because I think you're going to answer it because the the four and a half inch springs that I got from Rough Country had had a, a little angled piece of metal built into it. So right. It, it, and it, I think that would have rotated the the way it's on there. It would have rotated the axle uh, or, or the pinion up. So okay. I'm a little concerned. I, I did buy an angle finder. I just haven't used it yet. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be paying attention and probably asking questions here for myself as well. Okay, go well, on. Well, not by you're okay. You really. You know, you're okay, but it's fun to play with so that you know about it in case you want to go a little higher or something. Well, uh, actually, I'm, I am getting vibration, uh, and, and I was going to ask that, too. I get, uh, I think we've discussed this on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, the forum. I get vibration during acceleration. I mean, I get vibration while I'm going down the road. It's hard to tell if it's the tires or if it's the drive line. But I do notice uh, a little more vibration during acceleration around 55 miles an hour. This wouldn't give you vibration at a certain speed or during acceleration. This would be a, a constant vibration, I would assume. Um, not always. Sometimes uh, 55 is kind of the magic number. Um, it, it's kind of like it is for death wobble, too. Death wobble seems to like that speed. Um, it's, um, it can come at, at around 55 and then leave again. Um, just due to uh, the speed of the drive shaft, it'll fade out. Um, it doesn't have enough time to really start moving anything else around, so you don't feel it as much. Okay. But uh, sometimes, if it's really out a long ways, you can uh, uh, start in at 35 miles an hour, and, and by the time you hit 65, uh, you're wondering if the XJ is going to, start busting all the spot welds yeah no i don't have i don't have that problem at all so okay okay i'll bring up the uh, the next picture okay okay the first thing you want to do is to disconnect the rear drive line and i have to apologize because this picture is kind of dark because i wanted to show something that's kind of important when you do this uh if you've got a stock uh uh, Dana 35, and I'm not sure about the the uh, eight and a quarters, but on the Dana 35, um, the pinion yoke uses straps to hold in the uh, U joint, 
And those straps, when you bolt them down, they stretch. And uh, normally, uh, somebody like Tom Woods, when you buy a drive line from them, they want to sell you straps. And, and their reasoning is, is that you don't want to throw a drive line. And, and they recommend that every time you uh, disconnect your drive line to get new straps and new bolts to go with it. I've never bought new bolts, and I've taken my drive line off a bunch, and I haven't noticed any problem. Uh, that's kind of a Jeep recommendation, and I'm not sure it's really necessary. But uh, the straps, I have stretched straps before and, and thrown drive lines on some 1350U joints on my old Dodge pickup. So uh, this is something you have to pay attention to. Now what I did here, if you, if you can see it, is that I only took the straps loose on one side and took, pulled the bolts out and then rotated the straps so that they go back in the exact same position. So basically they should not need to be, uh, need any new ones this way. Um, you need to uh, make sure that uh, uh, those straps don't get in a different position. Now I see someone says that I'm um, touch and go on the audio. Um, uh, is it better now? Are you? Am I uh, garbling up on your end at all, Tony? No, it may it may be something related to UStream or bandwidth because um, you're constant here. I'm watching watching all the little lights and gauges, and you're fine. Okay, all right. Well, I want to make sure they can hear me. No sense in listening to me if you can't understand what I'm saying. So anyway, first thing you do is you know I've I've jacked my Jeep up here. And I disconnected the rear drive line and uh, and the straps are still attached loosely at one end. So I can keep track of them that way. They'll go back on exactly the way that they uh, came off. Okay, um, let's go to the next uh, slide right here. Okay, it's up. It may be a while before you see it, Steve, so you might want to start talking about it as soon as I say it's up. Okay. Well, I don't have it. There it is. Okay, here's the angle finder. There's my old craftsman that I've had forever. Kicked around my toolbox, made a couple of moves and everything that lasts a long time. Uh, what you want to do with this first measurement is you want to measure the angle of your transfer case. Now, this is my disc parking brake on the back of my Atlas, uh, since I don't have a 231 in anymore or a 242. Um, but the one of the good places to take this measurement on either one of those new process transfer cases is the fill nut. It's machined, and it's machined at an exact right angle to the uh, uh, shaft that goes through the uh, transfer case, the output shaft. So the way these angle finders are set up, they're uh, set up in 90 degree increments. So you can rotate them any way you want. And if you're checking the angle of something that's 90 degrees different, it comes out exactly right. So I checked my the angle of my uh, uh, transfer case, and it's 5 degrees. So what I have to do now, if I'm going to set up a, uh, a standard drive line is I have to match that angle on the pinion or get, you know, within a few degrees. You know, preferably somewhere in the neighborhood of two or three degrees would be satisfactory. So once I've taken this measurement, that's my goal. That's, that's the measurement that I've got to shoot for on the, the pinion. Is there anything... Or, I'm sorry, Steve, is there anything special you have to do on this angle finder? Because, you know, I, I've got the angle finder, but you have to, do you center it, center it to zero? Or, I mean, is, yeah. you just stick it on there and read read what it says. It's already zero. There's a pointer on there. Don't let that pointer throw you. You can adjust that. Put it any place you want. I've, I've never used it, that pointer. The, the thing that you have to pay attention to uh, here on the, you'll notice that, there are are four 
places on that angle finder, if you're looking at the numbers, where there's a zero. Okay, and then you notice the red there with that white line in the middle of it? Right. That's where you... So I'm... You can see that the zero there, if you can... You know, it's not a very big image, but that zero is just to the left of that white line. And so there's about a five... That pointer is on about five degrees there. So you're you're talking about the the large red mark, the translucent red that's at the bottom of the right. the gauge, and, yeah. and you're actually reading the little white line where the white line is is where the how many degrees you're you're reading the number of degrees for the angle of the transfer case. Yes, that is correct. Okay, and, and guys uh, and people listening on the podcast. Uh, this will be, I'll have the images available on uh, on the, the podcast site. So if you don't know um, where that is, I'll just tell you real quick. It's podcasts, plural, dot xjtalk.com, or you can just go to xjtalk.com and click on podcasts on the nav bar at the very top. Okay, go ahead, Steve. Okay, so we've got, uh, we've got that five-degree measurement. Now, the next measurement you take is is on the face of the pinion. And the reason that we disconnected that drive shaft is there's no place to take that except on the on the pinion yoke, unless you pull a differential cover. But uh, we don't need to do that. So that's why we disconnected the uh, uh, end of that drive line. So now let's go to the next slide here. Okay, number four is the CV angle. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, you want to need to measure the face on that pinion, you know, where the straps go. Okay, this, this shows the double, what is it, double cardigan CV joint? No, this is you want number single you, shaft. We're still doing that. I'm sorry? Right, but this is number four. Do you want number four or number five? Uh, well, whatever the next one is, it'd be number four, I guess. Okay, number four is up. It says the proper geometry for CV drive shaft. Oh, we missed one someplace. Okay, let me just explain it. Um, Would it be this one? This is number yeah, five. Yeah, one somewhere. <laughs> That's all right. Let me just explain it. Okay. Um, what you need to do is to measure the machined surface on the uh, the pinion, that yoke there. That's why we disconnected the drive shaft, so that we can get a nice flat spot there. You measure that angle. And let's say it's uh, uh, 10 degrees, or or maybe it's only two degrees. We don't know. Uh, let's let's say, for instance, that we had about a five degree angle on it to start with, and just for instance, we uh, uh, put in a four inch extended shackle with our kit, and now what we have is is something around 9 or 10 degrees. And that's a very common scenario. So what's going to happen there is that that drive shaft is going to vibrate because it's a little bit too far out. So what we want to do is a little subtraction. We're going to subtract 5 from 10 and we get 5 degrees. And uh, so now uh, what we would do is we would go down, what I would do, I'd just go down into Chico and I'd go to Payless and 4x4 four four and I'd get myself a 4 degree shim for the axle. And that shim, and I'd also get a stop at uh, Napa and get a new center bolt. And so then I would put uh, a C-clamp on that spring, that rear spring. I would take the old center bolt out and I would install this shim into the spring pack with the center bolt. So when you say shim and center bolt, it would actually be a pair because it would be on both both uh, leaf both springs. Sides. Yeah, you do it on both sides. Okay, and let me just make sure real quick. I, I have the image up where you have the, the angle finder on the, the, um, go. Yeah, I the yoke. Now. So just so everybody understands, uh, and, and I'm just kind of draw in here, the, the yoke is this part right here and I don't know how how long yep. it'll take for this to show up 
So basically where the bolts and the straps go is, and I would assume it's on either side um, of the of the yoke, uh, Steve, that, that flat you surface. Side, except that I left my straps on, remember, so you can only use one side. <laughs> oh, okay. So whichever side doesn't have the strap, if you took them both off, whichever then... Whichever side have the straps. So you can use either side, uh, and it's just basically where the bolts and the uh, go to hold on the straps. So that's right. that's the that's the area where you put this thing. And there's no adjustment on the angle finder. You just read what it says, and again, it's the the large red area, and you actually read what's in that little window. At, at least on this specific um, type of angle finder, yours may be different. Yeah, and that reading there is about 14 degrees. Wow. Okay. Now. I just, my Jeep is set up for a single yoke eliminator. I've taken my axle loose, and I just let it flop, and, and I said, yeah, that looks about right. I'll take that measurement. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, uh, I took that measurement as a for instance. Now, what I would do is I would subtract that 5 degrees from that 14 degrees. That gives me 9. Now, you can get shims in 2 four and six degree shims and that's about it so i would go get myself a six degree shim in this case okay wait a minute that would why would you subtract that why would you subtract the five that you got from your the back of your transfer case from the 14 here oh okay uh, the uh you you have five on the transfer case right right and you want to you want to make the pinion as close to five degrees as possible. So what you want to do is find the difference between that five degrees that you're aiming for and what you have. Are, are the two five degrees, or I mean, I'm sorry, are, is the angle, the angle supposed to be the same on both the transfer case and the, the pinion? Right. And so five degrees is where you want it to be, but it's not five degrees there now, it's at 14. So I'm going to subtract 5, and I get 9 degrees, right? Okay. But is it possible that it could be leaning the other way? In other words, it could be a negative uh, 3 degrees or? It can end up any old way. And especially if you get a lift kit with a shim in it, and you've added a shackle or you've added a, uh, um, uh, what do they call those kits? Uh, Blocks or something? Uh, oh, anyway, it's, it changes the, the angle of your shackle. You know, and, and that that puts about another two inches uh, on the end of, of a, well, it, it's like a two-inch extended shackle when you get done. You know, there, there's any number of, of things that you can do while you're changing your suspension that uh, will alter that angle, and that's why you need to measure it. There's no rule of thumb. I understand that, but I'm talking about, you. is it you always subtract the two uh, values? Yeah, you always subtract the little one from the big one so that you find how much difference there is. Okay. And the difference, that difference, you want to get a shim that's as close to that difference as you can. So in this case, I can only get a six degree shim. That's the biggest I can get. So I would go down and get myself a six degree shim and install that. Okay, and that would get me down six degrees from 14 is down to eight degrees. That's within three degrees of my transfer case angle. And so now that drive line, even though it's not perfect, is close enough that it's not going to vibrate. And would that also be close enough to keep the uh, from eating up U joints? Uh, on a four and a half inch lift, yeah, it's close enough that you don't have to worry about your U joints. Okay. Once you go above four and a half inches, um, the problem you run into is that our pinion slip yokes are very limited on the angle that they will accommodate. And so you have to, if you want to keep a standard drive line, and you can go higher than four and a half inches and keep a standard drive line, what you have to do is to get a, uh, a YJ slip yoke for a 231 transfer case. Those slip yokes have a longer shaft on them, or a longer sleeve that goes over the shaft, and they're also uh, cut deeper so that they will accommodate more angle. Okay. 
and if you've ever been under a YJ, they're, they have a steep angle to start with before you lift them on that drive shaft. Right, so, because they're so uh, short. That's that's why they're designed that way. Uh, Rusty sells them. Uh, any any Dana dealer can find one for you. Or you can go to Jeep and pay a lot of money for one. But well, that, uh, either that, way. That would be my choice. Yeah. <laughs> but you want to get as close, as, those angles, as close as you can. I see Weldman or Detour says two degrees is preferable. I agree. Um. I would think zero would be what you would be shooting for, but you don't you don't want to sh- uh, stack shims, do you? Well, it, it's going to be fat on one end. Okay, now, now here's the trick. Depending on which way the pinion is rotated determines on which side the fat, uh, which end of the spring the fat end goes. Okay. Okay, now with this one, the way the way I have it measured here, I need to bring the pinion angle down, so I would put the fat side on the back. Towards the back of the Jeep. Right, towards the back of the Jeep. If the pinion is too low for the uh, transfer case angle, then I would put the fat side in the front, and it would raise the pinion up. And I would assume you can check that just by taking the the uh, angle finder and phys- oh, yeah. physically yeah. moving it and seeing which way it needs to go. That way you could verify yeah, if it needed to go to the front or the back. Yeah, and after you put your 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 axle or your shim in and, and raise your axle up and put let the weight of the Jeep down on it and everything, you want to check your measurements. Again oh, yeah, absolutely, you yeah. You don't want to just throw it on there and, th- and say that's it. You need to uh, verify what you think is, is uh, what you think is going to be true. Yeah, it, it'll be very obvious if it's wrong anyway, but, but you can verify it. See how close you are. Anyway, uh, uh, that's what you do for standard uh, single U joints, and you can you can put a pretty fair angle on that drive shaft. I've I've run uh, five inches of lift just on the standard uh, uh, drive line with a stock XJ main leaf and everything, and uh, I didn't have any trouble. So it can be done, but one thing that happens is that there's a, a difference in those angles, the way that they're set up between the uh, uh, 96 and up Jeeps and and the earlier Jeeps. And I don't know what the difference is, but it's enough that a lift kit with the earlier Jeeps works real good, and you put it on, a, on the uh, later ones uh, after the body style changed, and everybody gets driveline vibrations and say that you have to... Uh, Go to a slip yoke eliminator with three inches of lift and all that stuff. No, you don't. You set your drive line up properly. Well, I think I need to do some work on mine that's going to require me to take the drive shaft out. So uh, when I have it out, I'll uh, I'll go through this and make some notes and um, report uh, on the website what um, how my ninety eight is with a, a four and a half inch lift. You know yeah. the, the the different well, the difference between the angles. One of the things I want to do is I want to get another guy out here and take some better pictures. And we're going to be setting his drive line up because we're going to be lifting his his XJ up. So we'll go through the whole thing with his, and he can help me take pictures. Uh, you know, above Timberline, uh, Rich he uh, he's real good at, at doing technical write ups. He used to do it for a living, and so uh, he does a great job with that stuff. And we'll we'll get together and and make something decent to stick in the technical section. Excellent. But anyway, okay, that's that's a procedure now for the single U joint stock drive line. Now the uh, if you go to a slip yoke eliminator, you have a different procedure than you do with the single U joint. When you so why don't we go to the uh, picture of the uh, geometry of the slip yoke, slip yoke eliminator drive line. Uh, would that be proper geometry for CV drive shaft? Yeah, CV drive shaft. Okay, I got it up. And Steve's just waiting for the image to show up on his screen. I'm I'm reading the 
some of the posts here. You know, everybody wants me to, somebody wants me to set up their Dana 60 and all that. Anyway. <laughs> uh, I know who that is. <laughs> now, uh, yeah, that was, that was uh, XJ4 IB. Yeah, it's Anyway, Scott. yeah. You notice that the engine is level again here, but now the differential is tipped up. And you have a straight line that goes through the shaft and through the pinion too. They're both the same angle. So what you want to do with this situation, instead of matching the angle of the pinion to the angle of the transfer case, you want to match the pinion angle to the angle of the rear of the drive line. So that's a straight line. Okay, let's go to the next image now. So now we don't have to measure the transfer case. We don't care what that is. That's the whole point of a split hook eliminator. It doesn't matter what angle that is or whether you've got a transfer case drop or not. And actually, if you're running one of these, you don't want to run a transfer case drop. You want to tuck that transfer case up as high as you can. It looks like you've got some sort of um, straight edge. In this picture, is that the is that the correct picture? <laughs> yeah, that's what I've got there. I've I've got a regular old common square from the hardware store, mm -hmm. and all I did was I couldn't find any string. We seem to be stringless around here, so I got a piece of red copper wire and attached it to the universal joint on the drive shaft and stretched it out and put the face of this square up on the pinion face there. still have my rear drive line disconnected. So that's the same. That part of it's the same. And I just tip the pinion up until the straight edge is roughly parallel with that wire. And that's all you have to do, except that you need to take your starting and your finish measurement there. And all to tip that up, all I do is... Uh, Put a hydraulic jack under the the front of the uh, uh, differential, and then just jack it up until it looks right with the uh, U-bolts loose. It's all you have to do. It's pretty simple. Okay, and so that, so tell me where the wire. What's the wire attached to on the front? Universal joint on the uh, back of the transfer case. Oh, okay. You said drive shaft earlier, and I was thinking the drive shaft isn't here, and I was confused. I thought maybe it was hanging down, and we couldn't see it. So. You've it is hanging down. You can't see it. <laughs> okay, but but you're attaching yeah. you're attaching to the universal joint that is the the one closest to the transfer case. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. But it, my CV joint is still on the back of the transfer case, and so I just tied the wire to the to the universal joint and and, and stretched it out there. Okay. And so you can just take your straight edge and and uh, uh, look at it and jack the front up a little bit. And, and uh, uh, if you want to do it that way, and just keep doing it until they're roughly parallel, and that's where you stop. And Take your measurement, and again, you subtract the two values. Let's say you started with uh, 5 degrees, and now you ended up with uh, uh, 10 degrees. Uh, that means you need to go get yourself a 4-degree shim. Okay, I'm I'm a little dense. I don't. Where's your Where's your measurement coming from? Because you don't have the start on the face of the pinion to start with, just with the weight on the on the axle, so it's where it's going to be mm -hmm. all the time. Okay, you've disconnected your drive line. You put your angle finder on the face, just like we did before, and you take the first measurement, and it'll be about five degrees on a stock rig. And then you, uh, now that you want to have a straight shot from the pinion up to the uh, uh, up to the transfer case there, you just keep jacking that pinion up until uh, this straight edge here is parallel with that wire or string that you've tied there, or if you want to. Do it a little faster and easier if you feel comfortable doing it. 
you can just eyeball it. You can tell whether it's a straight shot or not within a degree or so. Sure, but uh, when you say jack it up, you're talking about rotating the, the axle, the pumpkin. You're ro rotating yeah. it to, to match the angle. Yeah, just jack the pinion up the front of the differential, and it'll start tipping up, and uh, and you'll see it. You know, when I when I set my own up, I didn't use this square method. I, I robbed that off a of pirate. Okay. I thought good idea. I happened to see it yesterday, so I, I thought I would throw it in here, but you can just eyeball it. So whenever you rotate the an the, the axle, the U-bolts have been loosened or removed? Loosened oh, yeah. The, the connection got, to the well, springs. I don't remove them. I just loosen them up. Right. That way the vehicle can't fall. Right, because to me, when you said jack it up, I'm thinking you're actually lifting the axle, and I'm, I'm that was where I was getting confused. So you... Well, you just you loosen the U-bolts holding holding the axle to the leaf springs so that you can rotate it. And then when you yeah. when you jack, the jacking up of the axle has to do with rotating the pumpkin up so that yeah. you can match the angle. Or I guess down, but probably it's going to be up. So it's going to be up. The, so you can get the same Always angle. And then, once you do, and then once you've got the, when, once you've got it eyeballed or measured, now you do the same subtraction and now you know what shim size you need to get to go in between there to do the straight yep. shot. The fat part goes to the front, always on this. Right. And uh, and then you bolt it all up, bolt your drive shaft in, and and as long as it's within two or three degrees, it's it's not going to vibrate. Gotcha. Now I have found several vehicles when my son and I were looking for a Jeep for him. You know, we we got on Craigslist and we went looking at various Jeeps, and we looked at at two Jeeps that were lifted, and both of them had slip yoke eliminators or, you know, some kind of CV set up, and neither one of them had tipped the pinion up. So the drive shafts just vibrated like crazy at about 50 miles an hour. You know, and, and he was a little concerned about that. I said, don't worry about it, son. We can fix this in about 10 minutes. <laughs> but uh, we didn't end up getting either one of those. But... Uh, uh, it's very common to s put one of those in and not get the pinion angle right. And if you don't get it right, it will vibrate. It'll vibrate worse than if you had kept your stock drive line. Yeah, it makes sense. Okie dokie, you've got a few other pictures here. Is that uh, another another direction you want to go or something you want to add? Okay, I'm I'm ready to entertain questions. Okay. So, guys, um, do you have any questions for Steve 4.3 LXJ on uh, how to set up the drive angle on your XJ? Looks, uh, like, looks like there's conversations going on. Let's see. Scott XJ4IV says, ooh, me, me, me. Yeah. <laughs> He's asking about a 1310 yoke for a 60. No, I don't think they do. So, you guys ask away. You don't have to you don't have to wait to ask. If you got questions, ask them. I'll just say while we're waiting for a question that uh, Steve is a moderator and one of our technical ex experts on xjtalk.com. And of course, if you've read the um, the new disclaimer, xjtalk.com information is for entertainment purposes only. You take the full responsibility for any modifications that you make to your Jeep, not us. Weldman says, what about offset U-joint for Scott's problem? Offset U-joints? Uh, what's Scott's problem? Um, I think, uh, I guess this is in relation to, um, they make a 13 yoke for the 60. Oh, the 13, yeah, I, there is an offset U-joint, but they're, as far as I know, they're only for front axles. Um, let's see. <laughs> Detour Doing says, uh, I have nothing, not even smart butt. 
That's pretty unusual when Detours doesn't have anything to talk about. Uh, what I would do if I was uh, XJ4 IV, um, what I what I would do is have my drive, just take my stock drive shaft down and just have a, a different end put on it, uh, a 1350 or whatever it is end that he has. You can get a 1330 if you want, if you don't want to go so big. So Scott says in the chat room, uh, I'm trying to, that, that's XJ4IV, I'm trying to avoid buying new drive shafts right now. So uh, That's what I'm saying. Yes, yeah, and Steve, Steve is saying that uh, take the drive shaft down and have a different input on it so you can use the same drive shaft and still have it made up with the Dana 60 uh, yoke. Yes, yeah, a lot cheaper than buying a whole new shaft. Let's see, Big Jim, I want to know why I have no vibes when I set my drive line angles like you would for a CV drive shaft when I have no S or no CV drive shaft. Yeah, no, I don't know. No, no S have, I want to start making some measurements. You may just be within that five-degree window. Yeah, Jim, why don't you check the uh, check, get an angle finder and uh, see what the uh, the angles are. That might answer our question. I mean, if you're within, uh, what is it, Steve, less than six degrees you need to be to not have uh, vibrations? Yeah, less than six, preferably less than five. And uh, Scott, XJ4IV, says, would that be a weak point having the drive shafts stay stock size? I guess that would be putting the new end on it. No, it's not going to make it any weaker. Than it already is. I would think that if you have Dana 60s and um, and you use the standard drive shafts, your weak point is going to be the probably the transfer case at that point. Yeah, probably so. Is is running a, a 231 a good idea on a Dana 60 using two oh, Dana 60s? Huh? It's uh, done all the time. Okay. Yeah. I, I, it's not a big deal to, to run a 231. I mean, it's not like running a, a 241 OR or anything like that, but it's not that big a deal. A lot of people do it. That's amazing. I would, uh, the, the, the 231 and the 242, um, both, you know, with the chain drive, and it, it just doesn't look like it could handle that much uh, ump, but I guess it's not, well, it's it's not, not dead kind of weight. Tires, it's, it's not the differential, it's the tires. And, and, Lockers and the kind of rain you have. Right. How much that's, torque you're putting on it. Right. That's that's the deciding factor. If you're going to put 38 inch tires on and lockers and hit the rocks, that 231 may not last all that long. You were going to go with uh, 30s on uh, 30 inch tires on those Dana 60s, weren't you, Scott? I think he was going for the uh, low rider look. <laughs> Well, 30s would be definitely a low rider. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a uh, that would be a pumpkin dragger. <laughs> yeah, we could we could go wall crawling with that. <laughs> yeah, 38s. Oh, 38 crawler TAs. Right. Those are pretty sticky. And I don't think yep. you would you would have lockers at first, would you, Scott? Yeah, very, very expensive. That's, that's okay. You'll have a house that you can sell to pay for all this. Yeah, he said he's going to have lockers right away. Well, you know, as long as he stays out of the rocks. You guys are mainly mud down there anyway. Uh, he doesn't like the mud. He doesn't like mud? He doesn't well, like right. the mud. He, he hates he mud. Like <laughs> yeah, okay, 513 gear is unlocked. He's a little bit rock and roll, and I'm a little bit country. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I misread that. He says I'm a rocker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he's not referring to music, huh? <laughs> I agree, Jim. Well, if we don't have any other questions, we can move on to uh, leaf spring design if you want. Okay. So I would assume that would be the picture with leaf spring. 
Yeah, there's only two pictures there with Lee Springs. Yep. Okay, I've got the uh, number eight up. It looks like somebody's been doing some cutting here, and and I'm not talking about an emo. So what are we looking at, Steve? Okay. First picture here is uh, just a spring, a two-stage spring. <coughs> this particular one is an Isuzu spring. But when I took it apart here, the thing that that I wanted to draw your attention to is that you see that just sitting there, there's space between the leaves. There's a term for that. It's called snap. And a properly designed leaf spring is going to have a little bit of snap, at least an eighth of an inch between leaves. So when you're making a bastard pack up, you want to make sure that the the spring is like that. There's a little snap uh, between each leaf. Uh, it's not the end of the world if you don't, but what that does is ensure that you have a nice even uh, rate on your spring. If you've got leaves in there that are different uh, uh, different arch, so that you've got some that are high arched, you've got some in the middle that aren't, and then maybe uh, a high arch underneath it, um, it's not going to have a nice smooth uh, spring rate. It's going to have kind of a funny spring rate. And in order for it to act like a stock spring would, like you're used to, uh, it needs to have these characteristics. So when we make a bastard pack, now you're going to put these springs on a up against a main leaf, an XJ main leaf. An XJ main leaf only has four inches of free arch. So it has a lot of distance there, which is okay. It'll, it'll still uh, work like it's supposed to. And so the next question is, do you want to have a, a single stage spring or a two stage spring? Now single stage is what came on the Cherokee. That means that all the leaves have about the same arch and they have, you know, they're in, in there are four different lengths. And so a single stage spring, the stage refers to the spring rate. So it's got a constant spring rate when you when you push on it. And the single stage spring has the most flex that you can build into it which may be what you want. Uh, this is the kind of a spring that's going to stuff up into the fender well uh, very well. And in, and in fact, on my own, uh, I set mine up with a single stage spring with these leaves in, and I can stuff the tire all the way up into the fender well and, and hit the bump stop that I've extended a little bit. And uh, so let's go to the next uh, picture there if we can, Tony. Okay, got it up. What's the difference between these two? This one looks like it's put together. Yeah, well, this is actually the same spring, but you notice there's a, I haven't got the picture yet, but there's a, uh, a flat leaf on the bottom. Right. Okay, this is called a two-stage spring. Oh, uh, I, I think I'm understanding now. Okay, what that means is, is that you've got a single stage on the top there, those top leaves, and as you press them down, uh, they will come to the point where they hit that bottom leaf there, and it's pretty thick and heavy. And this type of spring is the type that uh, you get on a pickup or uh, or a v they, they're real common on S10s. If you get an S10 spring, they look like this. And uh, what they will do... Uh, is once that those leaf springs go flat on that 
that tough bottom leaf there, they don't move much further. So if you're making a bastard pack, the point here is that if you don't want your tire to stuff way up into the fender well, this is the kind of spring that you would use because it's not going to bend over backwards on you. Right. Now I see somebody saying overload. That's really not an overload spring, but everybody calls it one. Uh, see, Weldman and uh, XJ4IV have both used that word. Um, it's really the common, the proper term is the second stage. But uh, a real overload spring is a spring that goes on the top. Well, that's interesting. So uh, anyway, those on, we only put those on pickups. We don't put those on XJs. So I would think in this configuration, this would be the only reason you want to do this is if you didn't want to modify the bump stops on your XJ. That the if you're off roading your XJ, the single stage spring uh, only and proper uh, properly lengthened bump stops would be the way you'd want to go. Yeah, or if you're carrying a lot of gear all the time, there there's a lot of fellows that uh, they've got four or five hundred pounds of tools in the back of their and spare parts in the back of their XJ. So uh, this would be a good design for for that kind of a situation. Uh, both springs ride well. Uh, this is a way. This particular design with a two-stage spring is the way to have a spring that will carry a pretty good load, yet still have a decent ride on the highway. And so they've, they've used that design for years on all kinds of vehicles. Gotcha. So, uh, but anyway, that's the difference. And so before you set up your bastard pack, you need to answer the questions, what do I want my spring to do? What kind of load do I want it to carry? And how much do I want it to flex? And that will determine whether you use a single stage or a two-stage spring. What are you using on yours? But I'm using a single stage on mine. Okay. That's what I thought you said, but I just wanted to make sure. This this two uh, this two sp two stage spring that you took a picture of what was was that just something you took a picture of for demonstration purposes or are you using this uh, in a different vehicle? It, yeah, if you if you check my thread, uh, the perfect bastard pack maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I have pictures of it when I was setting it up. Okay. And I, I still have the same setup. It's it's a four leaf spring. I use the uh, the XJ main leaf. I used the number two and number three leaf out of this Isuzu spring. And then I took the main leaf and I cut it down to uh, um, 22 inches, 11 inches on the side, I believe, for the bottom leaf. Okay. And uh, and it writes nice. It it has a similar spring rate to uh, the stock spring, only it has a six-inch lift on it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, guys, we're running a little bit over an hour uh, tonight. Uh, just uh, just a few minutes, and uh, we'll be uh, we'll be wrapping this up uh, pretty soon. Um, did anybody have any questions for the 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 leaf spring different leaf leaf spring setups? It looks like it's pretty clear to me. Yeah, uh, Weldman has an interesting question. He says he's got an S10, and he did not use the overload or the bottom flat leaf. Uh, he probably put uh, uh, the main leaf underneath his uh, uh, under hit, you know, cut the eyes off and put it under his main leaf. If he takes that out, it'll soften it up. And of course, it'll also lower it a little bit. So, I noticed that I, I used all the leaves on an S10 spring. It was pretty stiff. Okay, anybody else? Questions uh, for Steve? Because he got three and a half inches out of the S10. That's typical for an S10 bastard pack. You have too much knowledge about too, too many cars, Steve. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, actually, Four IV said he's got four and a half off the Dakota Springs. That's another one that you can use. That's typical. Another one that would work nice for a good setup is uh, Comanche Springs. They have quite a bit of arch in them. Uh, they would be fun to play with. I haven't played with any of those, but uh, uh, maybe someday I will. Are those different because um, the nature of the Comanche is a pickup and they wanted to well, have the Well, uh, the Comanche springs go under the axle instead of over the top. Mm -hmm. So uh, they have to uh, have another five or so inches of arch in them just to sit in the same spot. Ah, okay. So uh, they have that extra arch in them. Weldman says, what about Ranger Springs, long box? Uh, I've looked at Ranger Springs. I wasn't real impressed with the Ranger Springs. Um, if if you're going to use that particular spring, I'd, I'd use the Isuzu before I use the Ranger Spring personally. Okay, guys, any other questions for Steve? Yeah, you got any questions, guys? Oh, are there, is there a difference that manufacturers were looking at to decide between spring over and spring under? Uh, that's a good question. Um, if, you, if you want something really tough, and, you know, you want to use a, a, a spring under. Um, it doesn't put as much uh, torsion on the uh, uh, spring itself. If you hit a bump or something like that, it doesn't uh, doesn't twist as much. So you don't uh, uh, get any axle wrap out of it. So that that's one of the, the, the things that they do is they'll put the spring under instead of over. And Jeeps for years and years and years were always spring under. Oh, one of the common things that I've heard, uh, you do not want to use blocks to lift um, the rear end of a, a Jeep because oh, okay. axle uh, wrap can occur since the, the leaf springs are not that um, not that thick, not that, um, they can't handle the, the the wrapping if you have a lifted block. That's what I've heard. Yeah, um, that's pretty much the case with a stock spring. Our, our stock XJ springs are kind of wimpy. And uh, you really don't want to use uh, too much of a block. You can use an inch block, an inch thick block. That's not going to hurt anything. But you start going two inches on our stock springs, and, and yeah, you can, you know, it's possible to uh, pull a drive shaft to the slip yoke out of the transfer case and stuff like that. Yeah, and I would assume that would be like what you would get with wheel hop, and uh, the whole reason w that uh, um, yeah, I had low range, a low range wheel hop would, you know, could do that kind of thing. Um, I mean, so, that, that uh, would be that would be the symptom. I would assume would be uh, like a wheel hop when when you if you felt the wrap, it would be like a wheel hop situation. Yeah, or if you uh, stuck it in low range and in reverse and uh, dumped the clutch, you know, that kind of thing. Gotcha. You good enough to, to maybe pull a, a drive shaft out. Okie dokie. Well, but guys, anyway, is, is okay. Uh, just don't go to two. Right. Excellent. And, yeah. To me, a one-inch block is, is something you do for a tune-up. You know, that's that's uh, when you're using a bastard pack and you put your front coils on and, and your Jeep doesn't quite sit high enough and back uh, uh you can stick a one-inch block in, in there, and the, and the best way to do that is to uh, take some two and a half inch by half inch uh, bar stock and cut them the same length as the uh, spring pads on the axle, and drill a hole in the center of them so that your center bolt goes through them too, so that you just don't have a block flopping around there. Excellent. Well, guys, we're going to wrap it up tonight. Steve, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, take you offline here, and I'll get back with you here just as soon as the show's over. Okay, guys. Well, that was uh, that's our hour show. I hope you enjoyed it. 
Uh, we went a little over, but uh, some great information from Steve. Uh, we really appreciate Steve being here and going through all this stuff. Um, I know I personally understand how to set the drive angle a lot better. I may still have to think about it while I'm doing it, but uh, now it just makes a lot more sense. Um, I think that it was the the difference between the 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 double, you know, the having the SYE or not having the SYE, and why is this one straight? Why is this one angled? It just doesn't look like it it matches up with uh, common common sense. At least that's the way it was for me. So I uh, want to remind you guys that we have a voicemail number that you can call in. And uh, if you have questions or comments, uh, also doing show promos, if you'll call in to 530-675-4102 uh, and leave a message, um, just uh, might want to start off with uh, who you are and where you're located and then your comment or question. Again, the number is 530-675-4102. And don't forget about Iron Man 4x4. Um, some great front-end, beefy products. And uh, many of you guys know Andy from the website. Uh, anybody listening, if you're looking for some great proje- uh, great products, not only for the XJ, but also, too, for uh, various other Jeeps, just go to the site, uh, ironman4x4fab.com, and check it out. Thanks again, guys. Have a very good night. Next week, we'll have Wayne Cantab27, and he'll be here for uh, questions after his uh, pre-recorded interview. Thanks, and have a very good night. Big Jim 350, and I f***ing love XJTalk.com.